On November 28, 2003, Sherida Williams, a 16-year-old resident of Pensacon Township, New Jersey, decided to treat herself to a nail appointment after the Thanksgiving holiday. Around 5 o'clock p.m., she left her home, which was conveniently just a short five-minute walk away from the local salon where her best friend was eagerly waiting for her. Sherida assured her parents that she would return shortly, but as hours passed without any sign of her, her parents grew increasingly worried. In a state of panic, her mother began reaching out to Sherida's friends, only to discover that even her best friend had not seen her that day. The disappearance of Sherida Williams left her loved ones questioning what could have possibly happened to her. Did she lose her way, or was there a more sinister reason behind her sudden vanishing? Pensacon Township, located in Camden County, New Jersey, is a suburban area neighboring Philadelphia along the Delaware River. As of the 2020 United States Census, the population of this township was approximately 37,000. Known for its significant industrial park, Pensacon houses major facilities such as a Pepsi bottling plant and the headquarters of J&J &J Snack Foods. The residents of Pensacon are known for their warm and welcoming nature, creating a peaceful community. However, it is worth noting that the crime rate in Pensacon in 2003 was higher than the national average, with 592 incidents per 100,000 people compared to the national rate of 478. Sherida Williams, a high school student, resided in Pensacon with her family. Born on October 1, 1987, she was the beloved daughter of Harry and Wilma Williams and grew up in a nurturing home alongside her sister, Sabrina, and brother, John Henry. Sherida possessed a keen eye for the arts, particularly photography, and had a deep passion for music and dance. Monday nights were cherished moments for the Williams family as they would come together to laugh, cry, and bond over the stories unfolding on the screen. Sherida actively participated in the youth group at Ashbury United Methodist Church in Pensacon, where she found an outlet for her strong sense of community and compassion. Sherida, a popular junior at Pensacon High School, possessed a deep fondness for children and eagerly embraced any opportunity to babysit for friends and relatives. Her playful nature and boundless energy endeared her to the children, who adored her in return. Sherida's strong empathy and love for her community fueled her aspiration to become a social worker and help people in need. Known for her bright and magnetic personality, she approached life with unwavering trust in the goodness of others. Sherida eagerly anticipated attending college and leaving a lasting impact on the world. Despite her big dreams, she also found joy in the simple pleasures of life, such as getting her nails, hair, and eyebrows done. On November 20, 2003. At 5 o'clock p.m., Sherita left her home to visit a salon located just a short five-minute walk away. Her plan was to meet her best friend there. However, the events that unfolded would forever alter the lives of those who loved her. When Sherita failed to return home at the expected time, her mother, Wilma, contacted her friend and was shocked to learn that they hadn't met at the salon. This revelation unsettled Wilma, as her motherly intuition sensed that something was amiss. As the night wore on, Sherida's parents clung to hope, anticipating her return, but she never came back. Unable to bear the weight any longer on November 29, 2003, Sherida's parents filed a missing person report. The Camden County Police swiftly initiated a search for Sherida in and around the salon and its vicinity. Meanwhile, her parents actively scarred the streets of Pensacon in search of their beloved daughter. A phone call from one of Sherida's friends added to their unease, suggesting that she might be in the vicinity of 36th Street, a place she had expressed fear of passing through. Acting on this tip, Wilma and Harry promptly drove to the area, hoping to find any trace of Sherida. Shortly before 3 o'clock p.m., in the vicinity of a railroad bridge at the intersection of 36th Street and Hayes Avenue in Pensacon, Wilma made a distressing discovery. She noticed what appeared to be a person lying on the gravel without proper clothing. Her maternal instincts immediately kicked in, prompting her to contact the Camden County Prosecutor's Office. Detectives swiftly arrived at the scene and uncovered the truth beneath the bridge. It was a teenage girl who bore a striking resemblance to Sherita Williams. Adjacent to her was her purse, containing her identification, which confirmed her identity. 
Sheridan was lying face up in the dirt, with her shirt torn open, pants unbuttoned, and hands bound behind her back. Although there were no visible injuries on her body, her undergarments had been forcibly removed, leaving red marks around her waist. The police had concerns that Sheridan may have been subjected to sexual assault. Adding to the distressing situation, a durag was found around her neck, suggesting it may have been used to silence her cries. Additionally, two plastic bags from a nearby sporting goods store were discovered lodged in her mouth. One of the bags contained a receipt for a black shirt purchased at 4.28 p.m. on the same day she went missing. The devastating news of Sherida's death deeply impacted Wilma and Harry's lives, as well as sending shockwaves throughout the community. As the police and concerned neighbors gathered around the Williams residence, those who knew Sherida expressed their grief. One neighbor described her as a kind-hearted individual who did not deserve such a fate. The Camden County Police officially classified Sherida's death as a homicide and initiated an investigation into the crime scene where she was found. It was determined that Sherida had been strangled and suffocated. Furthermore, there were indications of bodily fluid stains on her jeans, suggesting a sexual assault had taken place. Despite the absence of obvious physical trauma, no knives or bullets were discovered in close proximity. However, the police did uncover some peculiar items at the scene, including a man's hair cap and a penny believed to belong to the perpetrator. The hair cap was sent to the laboratory for analysis in hopes of finding hair strands and other potential evidence. In order to reconstruct Sheridan's final movements, investigators reviewed surveillance footage from the nail salon in Pensalkin that she frequently visited. The footage revealed that she was at the salon at 6.5 p.m., getting her eyebrows done. Subsequently, the detectives examined credit card receipts, interviewed customers of the salon, and questioned individuals who may have been present at the crime scene. Unfortunately, no significant breakthrough was made, and the identity of the killer remained elusive. The detectives became intrigued by how Wilma and Harry had known to search near the bridge. Wilma explained that while she was making calls to find Sherida, one of her friends had mentioned the 36th Street Bridge, stating that Sherida had expressed fear about crossing it. Harry believed that this friend might possess additional information about his daughter, prompting the detectives to focus on this new lead and approach Sherida's friend for an interview. The friend claimed that she had mentioned the 36th Street location to Wilma on a hunch, as Sherida sometimes took that route to visit her boyfriend. Additionally, the police discovered that Sherida had made a call to her boyfriend in Camden from a nearby payphone around 6.30 p.m., just before her disappearance. The police located the boyfriend and spoke to him in the presence of his mother. He confirmed that Sherida had visited him that night at around 6.30 p.m., but he had been asleep in his bedroom due to his night shift work as a security guard and had not seen her. His mother admitted to speaking to Sherida at the door, but not allowing her inside because she did not like her. Despite tagging the boyfriend as a suspect, the detectives lacked physical evidence linking him to the crime scene, and he also passed a lie detector test successfully. Eventually, he was cleared of suspicion. Following this setback, the detectives meticulously reevaluated the evidence, with a particular focus on the t-shirt receipt found in the plastic bag. It was determined that the receipt was from the Model Sports Goods store in the Sherry Hill Mall. However, upon their visit to the store, they encountered yet another obstacle. The surveillance cameras at the establishment had malfunctioned on the evening of November 28th, leaving no available footage. In light of this setback, the detectives decided to pursue a lead they had received as a tip. An unidentified individual claimed to have seen one of Sheridan's male friends driving near the bridge on the night of the murder, suggesting that Sheridan may have been in his car. Interestingly, this male friend happened to be dating one of Sherida's acquaintances, and rumors circulated that he had feelings for Sherida. Given that Sherida had used a payphone, investigators speculated that she may have called this friend for a ride, unaware of his romantic interest in her. Consequently, the friend was summoned to the police station for an interview. Although he appeared nervous, he cooperated with the authorities. He openly admitted his fondness for Sherida and acknowledged driving her around the area on previous occasions. However, he vehemently denied being with her on the night of the murder, claiming that he had picked up his girlfriend from her job at the mall and returned home directly. 
While his alibi lacked solidity, there was no concrete evidence linking him to the crime, resulting in his eventual clearance. After three months of no new leads, a breakthrough finally occurred. The crime lab successfully extracted a DNA sample from a bodily fluid stain found on Sheridan's clothing. Immediately, the police initiated the collection of DNA samples from individuals acquainted with Sherita, hoping to find a match. Additionally, samples were obtained from male suspects. Unfortunately, all these efforts failed to yield a match. Determined to make progress, the detectives took an extra step by running the DNA sample through CODIS, the FBI's national crime database. Once again, this avenue proved fruitless as no match was found. Despite the dwindling leads and the case growing cold, Sheridan's parents refused to lose hope. Her father, Harry, persisted in contacting the police every week to stay updated on the case's progress. Even the police officers involved remained dedicated to finding justice for Sherita. In March 2007, a significant breakthrough occurred. Four years after Sheridan's murder, the police made a startling discovery. A new individual had been added to CODIS, and their DNA matched the bodily fluid sample found on Sherida's genes. This revelation led them to a 22-year-old man named Warren Dixon, who was previously unknown to anyone involved in the case. Upon further investigation, it was revealed that Warren had attended the same school as Sherida after transferring from Camden High to Pensacon High. Interestingly, Warren, who was 18 at the time of Sherida's murder, had dropped out of school shortly after the tragic event and relocated to Pennsylvania. Two years later, he was arrested on drug charges, which resulted in his details being entered into the CODIS database. Notably, Warren lived just two blocks away from the bridge on 36th Street, indicating his proximity to the crime scene. The police speculated that he may have intercepted Sherida on that fateful night after she left her boyfriend's house. Tracking down Warren was relatively easy for the police, as he had returned to New Jersey and was required to attend weekly probation meetings. They approached him during one of these meetings and requested his presence for a police interview. Throughout the questioning, Warren remained outwardly calm, although he seemed to struggle with social interaction. He admitted to knowing Sherita during high school, but claimed to have only learned about her murder through the news. However, when confronted with the presence of his DNA at the crime scene, he confessed to having intimate contact with Sherida on the night of November 28, 2003. The authorities then presented Warren with the hair cap found at the crime scene, without disclosing its origin. Initially, Warren provided evasive answers, but eventually admitted that the hair cap belonged to him. Additionally, Warren displayed an unusual level of interest in the case, constantly posing peculiar questions to the detectives. During a particular moment, he inquired, if I were to unintentionally do this, would I still be required to face imprisonment? In a subsequent interrogation with the police, Warren finally admitted his guilt. He confessed to intercepting Sherida on the night of the murder and making unwanted advances towards her, which she rejected. This led to a violent escalation that tragically resulted in her death. The exact motive behind Warren placing the two plastic bags in Sherida's mouth remained unclear. Despite a lab report in January 2009 that showed no match between Warren's hair and the strands found on the cap, authorities believed they had sufficient probable cause and evidence to charge him based on his confession. In January 2009, Warren Dixon was apprehended and charged with aggravated manslaughter in a New Jersey Superior Court. During his arraignment, the judge set his bail at $750,000. Sherida Williams' family attended the court proceedings to share their memories of Sherida and display photographs documenting her life from infancy. I want the court to truly understand who she was, to witness her growth, emotionally stated Harry Williams. Warren displayed uncooperative behavior in court, refusing to stand when ordered by the judge and requiring deputies to forcefully remove him from his chair at one point. He remained unresponsive only answering one question regarding legal representation. The final trial commenced in March 2011. Warren Dixon, 25 years old at the time, pleaded guilty to attempted aggravated assault and aggravated manslaughter. The Williams family was present to witness their daughter finally receive justice after seven long years of sorrow and unanswered inquiries. Sherida's mother and aunt wore buttons adorned with Sherida's image during the court proceedings. 
On June 3, 2011, Superior Court Judge Samuel Nettle sent his warrant to 20 years in prison, specifying that he would only be eligible for parole after serving 85% of this sentence. Additionally, Warren would be subject to lifetime community supervision and listed in New Jersey's Registry of Convicted Sex Offenders. Currently, official records indicate that he is currently incarcerated at East Jersey State Prison and will be eligible for parole in 2026. Following the trial, Harry, Sherida's father, expressed his concern as to why Warren would be granted parole when his daughter was gone forever. He firmly believed that Warren should have received a life sentence instead. Despite his grief, Harry expressed gratitude towards the Camden County Police and the entire community for their efforts in bringing justice. He acknowledged that it was a collective endeavor involving the media, family, prosecutor's office, and friends, and he considered the conclusion of this saga. Throughout the years, Harry developed a connection with Surgeon Martin Wolf from the prosecutor's office, who served as the lead investigator in the case. Whenever Harry reached out to inquire about the case or simply to share his grief, Wolf always paid attention. Wolf dedicated more time to solving this murder than any other case during his 17 years in law enforcement. When Detective John Greer took over the case in 2008 due to Wolf's military deployment, Harry was overcome with emotions. However, Greer remained determined and motivated by the Williams family's unwavering resolve. The family organized annual marches to the 36th Street Bridge, where Sheridan's body was discovered which served as a source of encouragement for Greer. It was this dedication that ultimately led to the resolution of the cold case. Harry made it a point to contact the Camden County Prosecutor's Office every Monday, seeking answers and requesting meetings, ensuring that the tragedy of Sheridan's murder would never be forgotten. In a subsequent interview with the media, Harry directed his message to teenage viewers, emphasizing the importance of not blindly trusting everyone they meet, as hidden motives may exist. He described Sherida as a loving and gentle person who trusted everyone and never anticipated anyone would cause her harm. He recalled her reassuring words on the last night she left home, saying, I'm 16, Dad. I'll be fine. Pursuing higher education had always been a part of Sherida's aspirations for the future before her life was tragically cut short. To pay tribute to her memory, Pensacon High School bestowed Sherida with a posthumous diploma. In the serene and picturesque streets of Gold Coast, Queensland, an ordinary evening took a dark turn, plunging an entire community into a state of shock and disbelief. On the fateful evening of September 9, 2015, Tara Brown, a vibrant young woman full of dreams and aspirations, found herself entangled in a web of events that would ultimately lead to a tragic end. As we embark on this harrowing journey, we delve into the chilling repercussions that transformed a once promising love story into a nightmare of unimaginable cruelty. This tale serves as a stark reminder that love at times can morph into a malevolent force, leaving behind scars that reverberate through generations. Throughout this gripping narrative, one cannot help but wonder how such a promising love story could take such a chilling turn. Were there any warning signs that could have averted this tragedy? Gold Coast, situated in Queensland, Australia, is renowned for its idyllic beaches, vibrant nightlife, and the plethora of recreational activities. Often hailed as a tourist haven, this coastal paradise boasts stunning coastlines, including popular beaches like Surfers Paradise, Broad Beach, and Burley Heads. The city is also home to renowned theme parks such as Dreamworld, SeaWorld, and Warner Brothers Movie World, making it a hub of entertainment. Despite its allure, Gold Coast maintains a relatively lower crime rate compared to larger Australian cities. Given these factors, it is difficult to comprehend the heinous act committed by a local resident named Lionel Patier. Tara Brown, born on March 21, 1991, in Hamilton, New Zealand, relocated to the Gold Coast with her family during her teenage years. Fast forward to 2011, Tara fell in love with Lionel John Petir, a member of the Bandidos gang. A year later, they welcomed a beautiful daughter into their lives, 
whose identity remains undisclosed for privacy reasons. Tara embodied the essence of the Gold Coast, the sunshine, the golden beaches, and the tight-knit community. Growing up in this coastal haven, she developed a zest for life and a thirst for adventure. Tara's involvement in touch football at a representative level was just one aspect of her dynamic personality. Her insatiable curiosity and zest for exploration drove her to constantly seek out new experiences and knowledge. However, her proudest role was that of a mother, and she approached it with unwavering love and dedication. Whenever her daughter was mentioned, Tara's face would light up, radiating the palpable love she felt. Unfortunately, amidst her vivacity and the love that surrounded her, the shadows of fate were waiting to cast a dark cloud over her sunny days. Lionel Pettier, a former member of the Bandidos gang, had a troubling history of domestic violence and criminal behavior. His journey into a life of crime began in 2009, with charges ranging from assault to possession of stolen property. Despite facing legal consequences, Paytier managed to evade convictions in some cases, resulting in mere fines. Over the years, his recklessness escalated as he faced charges of public nuisance, unlawful possession of suspected stolen property, and willful damage, showcasing a blatant disregard for the law. Even probation orders did not deter him, as he repeatedly breached them, displaying a pattern of defiance. In 2012, Paytier's tumultuous relationship with Tara Brown took a turn for the worse. He not only breached protection orders, but also made threats and caused damage, revealing an alarming level of hostility. Despite brief periods of incarceration, Paytier remained undeterred, accumulating multiple convictions and fines. Behind the facade of smiles and apparent family bliss, a darker reality of abuse and control was hidden. Tara, once strong and confident, began to doubt herself due to Petty's threats and manipulation. Their relationship became a turbulent cycle of breakups and reconciliations, marked by police interventions and protection orders. However, everything changed in 2015, when Tara made a courageous decision during a trip to New Zealand. The unraveling of her life began at the departures lounge of Auckland International Airport. She had briefly returned home with her mother to assist in scattering her grandfather's ashes before heading back to the Gold Coast, where she had been living for the past few years. However, everything took a dramatic turn during her journey. Tara, her mother, and Petia were at the airport, ready to fly back to Australia. Interestingly, Petia had also come to New Zealand but had chosen to make separate travel arrangements from Tara and her mother. Although they were all departing on the same day, they had opted for different flights and bid their farewells at the airport. The goodbyes seemed normal at first, but when Tara started texting a friend, things quickly escalated. In a shocking twist, Petia appeared out of nowhere, consumed by anger and suspecting Tara of being unfaithful. This led to a heated confrontation, and Tara's attempt to escape turned into a chilling chase through the airport. Airport security guards had to intervene to separate the couple, although no arrests were made. After this intense encounter, the situation reached a boiling point. Tara hoped for some normalcy as she headed home, but things took a terrifying turn. Later that same day, Tara returned to the home she shared with Petia to pack her belongings. However, Petia, fueled by rage, suddenly arrived home and forcefully entered the house. The argument quickly escalated and turned physical as he pushed and cornered her. The once shared home became a battlefield. Petia shouted and demanded that Tara move out, denying her access to their daughter. Yet, he wouldn't allow her to leave either. He took control by cutting off her contact with the outside world, using her phone to drain her bank account and send deceitful messages to her loved ones, trying to portray himself as the victim and Tara as the wrongdoer. Petia was relentless in his efforts to convince everyone of his twisted version of the truth, even going as far as trying to turn everyone Tara knew against her, 
by claiming she was involved with another man. Using Tara's cell phone, Patia conducted a transfer of funds from her account to his own and deceitfully utilized a Facebook account to send messages to her friends and employer, falsely confessing to her actions. However, the truth remained that she had not engaged in any such activities. Days later, displaying a complete lack of empathy, he heartlessly evicted Tara from their shared residence, carelessly denying her the right to take their daughter with her. In a shocking turn of events, he even entrusted the care of their child to his aunt, while demanding irrefutable evidence that Tara was not in the child's presence. Over the course of the following days, Tara sought solace in confiding in her boss at the law firm where she was employed, desperately seeking safety. With unwavering support from her boss, she took a crucial step towards securing sole custody of her daughter and forging a life free from the clutches of her abusive partner. Finding refuge in a safe house, she stayed with a friend, yearning for a fresh start and determined to reclaim her life, establish stability for her daughter, and finally break free from the shackles of her past. During this time, Tara collaborated with her boss to prepare an application for sole custody of their daughter while simultaneously devising plans for her new life. However, fully aware of Patia's untrustworthiness, she reached out to the Gold Coast Police to obtain a domestic violence protection order. Unfortunately, her concerns were dismissed as the police had encountered numerous instances where women had made false allegations in order to gain an advantage in family court proceedings. On September 3, 2015, Tara visited the Southport Police Station, having arranged for a private room through her lawyer. Gripped by fear of payte, she hoped for a receptive audience at the station. However, the situation did not unfold as anticipated. The police refused to provide a private room, and the officer at the reception displayed a disinterest in hearing their account. Despite Tara possessing text messages that clearly demonstrated Patia's threats, after consulting with the surgeon, the police concluded that there was insufficient evidence to substantiate claims of domestic violence. Although Tara did not receive assistance at the police station, a glimmer of hope awaited her just beyond the horizon. On Monday, September 7, 2015, the turning point in Tara's custody battle occurred when the legal documents were delivered to Petia's attorney. This resulted in Tara obtaining sole custody of her three-year-old daughter. Little did anyone anticipate that this event would trigger a drastic change in Petia's behavior. Despite the existence of a protection order meant to keep him away, Petia relentlessly pursued Tara, disregarding the law. Unaware of the imminent danger, Tara left her aunt's house on the fateful morning of Tuesday, September 8, 2015, to drop off her daughter at daycare. If only she had known that Patia had already contacted the daycare half an hour earlier to inquire about their daughter's schedule. After safely dropping off her child and driving away in her Mazda, Tara felt a sense of relief. However, in a horrifying twist, Patia suddenly appeared in his menacing black SUV, closely tailing her. Gripped by fear, Tara urgently dialed emergency services, expressing her belief that he intended to harm her. At an intersection, trapped by a red traffic light, Patia closed in on her, aggressively pounding on the glass and demanding that she exit the vehicle. A glimmer of hope emerged as the light changed, allowing Tara to accelerate and escape his clutches. Nevertheless, undeterred, Patia continued to pursue her. Tara's desperate pleas for assistance filled the air, her panic escalating as she urgently relayed her location to the police, imploring them to come to her aid. Shockingly, Peter then forced his own girlfriend off the road and brutally attacked her with a 7.8 kilograms methyl fire hydrant cover, resulting in her tragic death within the overturned vehicle. Disturbing CCTV footage later emerged, capturing Patia grabbing the lethal fire hydrant cover and charging towards Tara's car. This chilling scene provided a glimpse into the unimaginable violence that ensued. Amidst these dark moments, 
a neighbor named Lisa Kennedy, managed to capture the lead-up to this abhorrent act on her own CCTV system. Witnessing the tragic events unfold before her eyes, she hurriedly made her way down the driveway, letting out piercing screams and desperately attempting to come to Tara's aid. She recounted her frantic efforts to intervene, pleading for assistance and shouting at Patty. In a cruel twist of fate, other neighbors, unaware of Patty's sinister intentions, rushed to the scene of the overturned car, assuming he was there to offer help. Unknowingly, they unknowingly assisted him in breaking one of the car windows, completely unaware of the unimaginable tragedy that had just occurred. It was only upon hearing Tara's cries that they realized the horrifying truth. Patia was there to inflict harm. Patia mercilessly fought off those who tried to intervene, leaving the community shattered and grappling with the brutal reality of domestic violence. On September 8, 2015, Lionel Patia turned himself in to the police approximately 30 minutes after he had taken Tara Brown's life. In 2017, he pleaded guilty to her murder and was subsequently sentenced to 20 years in prison. Once a member of the Bandido Biker Gang, Lionel Patier faced the unwavering hand of justice as he received a life sentence for the savage murder of Tara Brown on the Gold Coast. Dressed in a somber black suit and black tie, his wrists bound in handcuffs, Patier remained stoic as Natalie Hinton, Tara's mother, addressed the court, labeling him a monster for robbing her daughter of her life. Hinton vividly portrayed Tara as a kind-hearted and trusting individual who cherished life from a young age. According to Hinton, Patia consistently sought validation from Tara and employed insidious tactics of domestic violence, such as gaslighting, to erode her self-esteem. In her eyes, Tara became trapped in a life of fear under the control of this monstrous presence. Natalie Hinton, Tara's mother, wept silently as she listened to the details of Patia's brutal assault on her daughter, pushing away anyone who tried to intervene. I had no idea of the extent of his sickening actions, she expressed. My entire world crumbled around me as this misogynistic narcissist took the life of my precious girl. There were numerous indications of his violent behavior, yet no one was able to recognize and take decisive action against him in a timely manner. Initially, the police officers failed to comprehend the severity of her situation just days before her tragic demise, resulting in their inability to save her life. Queensland Health also made grave errors by neglecting to address Tara's relationship anxiety during subsequent visits, despite her mentioning it during a prenatal appointment. Furthermore, during the birth, the hospital staff overheard Patia making threats towards Tara's mother, yet they allowed him to remain present and did not alert the authorities, despite being aware of the domestic violence protection order prohibiting his presence. Finally, Justice Debra Mullins, while delivering a life imprisonment sentence for Patia's conviction, expressed a desire for him to understand the profound impact of Tara's death, a pain that cannot be adequately expressed in words. Patia acknowledged his guilt with the full support of his family, who encouraged him to face the consequences of his actions. In a statement read by Solicitor Campbell McCallum outside the court, Patia expressed his remorse and his desire to spare Tara's family any further anguish. He accepted the punishment imposed by the justice system and acknowledged that he would ultimately be judged by a higher power. Patia acknowledged that Tara's memory would endure and that he would never be forgiven. He hoped that by accepting responsibility, he could prevent any additional pain and suffering for Tara's family. Today, we examined the tragic case of Tara Brown, a young mother whose life was tragically cut short due to domestic violence inflicted by her former partner, Lionel Patia. Tara's story highlights the urgent need for a more effective response to domestic violence cases and the necessity for comprehensive training within law enforcement agencies. The police's failure to acknowledge the threat and respond appropriately is a somber indication of the deep-rooted flaws within our system. 
in honor of Tara Brown and the numerous victims of domestic violence, let us endeavor to create a society where such heartbreaking incidents are eradicated. Education, awareness, and a united endeavor are pivotal in effecting change and guaranteeing the security and welfare of everyone. If you or someone you know is enduring domestic violence, please seek assistance as you are not alone. Together, we can bring about a transformation and put an end to the cycle of violence.